watching ABC News 24. Hello, I'm Andrew Gagan. Queensland Health is investigating a link between a Brisbane catering company and a fatal salmonella outbreak. A 77-year-old woman has died and 220 people have fallen ill after attending Melbourne Cup functions. Dr Susan Vlack from the Metro North Public Health Unit says the company in question provided food for up to 40 different events. Often they're a combination of factors. You might start with some sal salmonella in the food that's originally processed, that's cooked or um, refrigerated or served up and held for a period of time before it's served. So all of those things can contribute to the bacteria multiplying in the food. So we, we investigate the whole chain of events. Most people would be sick, um, have been sick already or be sick now, but you can be sick up to two weeks later. All right, so the next few days, next four or five days perhaps, is the key time to, to be aware. There's not too many people who've been very sick. We've had um, seven people we've identified as being hospitalised for this problem or in association with this problem. And probably about two of those are reasonably sick. Police have charged three men under the Queensland Government's new anti-bikey laws. The legislation aims to restrict the ability of criminal gangs to associate. It's alleged two of the men are members of the Mongols motorcycle gang and the other man is a member of the Finks. Police claim the three men were together in the foyer of a hotel at Main Beach late last night. They've been remanded in custody. Police will allege that the three men taken into custody are members of a criminal motorcycle gang. They've been arrested and charged under the new legislation in relation to criminal organisations insofar as more than two of them in a public place. The ABC will cease nighttime helicopter flights until it acts on recommendations from a report into a chopper crash that killed three staff members. Journalist Paul Lockyer, cameraman John Bean and pilot Gary Ticehurst were killed when the aircraft crashed near Lake Eyre in August 2011. Transport authorities found spatial disorientation on a dark night was a major factor. The ATSB is calling for greater regulation when it comes to flying at night. The federal government has announced just four members of parliament will be allowed to attend the Gallipoli centenary in 2015. The Prime Minister and Minister for Veterans Affairs will attend, as will their opposition counterparts. The delegation is being kept deliberately small so more members of the public can attend. The ballot for tickets to the Anzac Day service opens on Saturday and 8,000 places will be available. Time now for Capitol Hill with Lyndall Curtis live from Canberra. Thank you. A standoff over the debt cap as Kevin Rudd brings down the curtain on his parliamentary career. This is Capitol Hill. Welcome to the program. I'm Lyndall Curtis. It was a week of firsts for the first week of the 44th Parliament. The first question times for the new Prime Minister and new opposition leader. The first major battle over legislation, with the House of Representatives this afternoon rejecting Senate amendments to its bill to lift the debt ceiling to $500 billion. There were first speeches from new MPs and the first resignation. At the end of the first parliamentary week, the Prime Minister is tonight leaving for the Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting to join other Commonwealth leaders in Sri Lanka, except for the Prime Ministers of Canada and India who are boycotting the gathering. Last night, the member for Griffith, former Prime Minister Kevin Rudd, also announced he was leaving. His final destination is still unknown. We will take a look at Kevin Rudd's uh, statement to Parliament and at the reaction to his statement. And we're just, uh, we're just looking now at the shots of the Prime Minister arriving at the RAAF base at Fairburn where he's getting on the plane to take that flight to Sri Lanka for his first Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting. There comes a time in our lives as parliamentarians when our families finally say enough is enough. My family has reached just such a time. <clears throat> we ask <clears throat> much of our families in this place, and in the case of my family, well above and way beyond the call of duty. For me, my family is everything, always has been, always will be which is why I will not be continuing as a member of this parliament beyond this week. And uh, the member for Griffith, 
won an election uh, which uh, uh, pitted him against the person whom I believe to have been the most <coughs> successful Prime Minister uh, in modern Australian times. And it takes uh, extraordinary ability, uh, insight, guts and focus to win such a contest. And he didn't just win uh, that contest in 2007, he triumphed. The idea that the man that had won in this presidential campaign an election against John Howard was then going to be disposed of, discarded, like a, another course on a lazy Susan in a Vietnamese restaurant. The cruelty of it was extraordinary. Uh, for our family, recent statements <clears throat> uh, since the September election have been particularly hurtful. This is a tumultuous era in Labor, and with the member for Griffith's resignation tonight, part of it comes to a close. My family have given uh, their all for me in public life. And for the nation. But even if we disagree about one policy or another, that is an extraordinary triumph of the human spirit, that you could overcome those setbacks, that betrayal that would have crushed so many other people. As uh, parliamentarians, we might say we become... Oh, thank you for that. <clears throat> if you've got any gin, I'll have some of that too. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, Nothing has brought me greater joy in political life than the smiles I have seen on the faces of our Aboriginal brothers and sisters, young and old, country and city, as a result of the apology. It was a great moment in our history, and to the credit of the member for Griffith, it happened because of him. Much as I admire and appreciate and put on a huge pedestal his immediate predecessor, in this respect at least, his immediate predecessor had lacked the imagination to grasp that opportunity and the member for Griffith, Kevin, he had the decency to see that here was something that needed to be done. He does have, and even his harshest critics, of which there are some, would say that there he does have a special relationship with the Australian people. You could go to any shopping centre in Australia and it is near as close the most politicians will achieve to some degree of above politics celebrity. Be gentle with each other. Be gentle with each other. Thirteen years ago when my twins were born, after a very difficult pregnancy and a long period of time getting there, the member for Griffith could not have been more supportive for me as a human being. But the fact is, he is still a decent man who deserves all the very best for his future. He chose to put the party that he loves first, before his own interests and the interests of his family. And so, having said all of that, on this uh, final occasion in the Parliament, and as is now officially recorded in the classics for occasions such as this, it really is time for me to zip. <laughs> Joining me to reflect on the Rudd era and today's events are Labor Senator David Feeney and Liberal MP Steve Chobo. Now, David Feeney, I must correct Senator myself. Senator no longer. Senator That's no right. longer. Mm. You're one of those who made the transition to the House of Representatives. Exactly. There are a lot of kind words about Kevin Rudd last night, but the truth is, in, isn't it? You once moved to get rid of Mr Rudd. Are you glad he's finally gone? Listen, I think this is the a right of moment for us to congratulate Kevin Rudd on the contribution he's made. I think last night we saw the Parliament strike a note of generosity, of recognising the good that was done and the accomplishments that were made. Um, and I think, as Bill Shorten said, this does bring to an end a tumultuous period for Labor. Um, but we want to have that end marked by generosity of spirit rather than uh, by recrimination. I think Kevin can leave the Parliament with his head held high, knowing that um, right to the very end he did his duty for the Labor Party. Uh, Steve, 
Steve, there, there are a lot of fine words uh, from the Prime Minister and Malcolm Turnbull and Christopher Pine last night. They weren't words that you have used about Kevin Rudd for most of the last six <laughs> years. Why only now do you say these nice things about him? Well, look, I mean, to some extent, that's the nature of the beast in terms of politics, Lyndall. We know that uh, it's a fairly conflict-rich environment. Uh, we have an adversarial system. The reality is that there's an opposition and there's a government. And, you know, although the roles may interchange, uh, we have a very adversarial system. So uh, that doesn't in any way, shape or form mean that we don't appreciate the contribution that's made by others. Although, and look, I appreciate the Australian public would like to see a lot more of it. But the reality is that, uh, you know, we've got a job to do and that's to differentiate ourselves from each other. Uh, we recognise and, look, applaud uh, that Kevin Rudd was Prime Minister of the Nation. Uh, he's one of the few people that reached that level. Uh, from my perspective, though, uh, there's a legacy of issues there that he's left us. But that's not the time now to focus on that. The time now is to applaud a man who reached the zenith of politics in Australia, was our nation's leader. And for that reason, uh, you know, we acknowledge that. Uh, David, political parties occasionally walk away from the legacies of their former Prime Ministers. You've got two former Prime Ministers in your recent past who've now both gone. Mm. Are you going to be holding on to their legacies? Well, and I, th I think the answer to that is yes, and I think that's already been made clear. I mean, I th the Labor Party and Bill Shorten have made clear that there's obviously um, serious mistakes and errors were made over the over the sort of Rudd-Gillard period, um, the division of Labor being the most profound of those. Um, but we're not going to um, say that and acknowledge that without also acknowledging the fact that the government had an extraordinary amount of accomplishments, taking this country through the GFC, uh, inno innovations like the National Disability Insurance Scheme, and I could go on. Those are things the Labor Party will continue to stand behind and defend. Uh, Steve, you wouldn't expect Labor to be walking away from the things it fought for for the last six years, would you? Well, you know, Lindell, it's interesting to hear David's response because the reality is that there are a number of things Labor is now trying to crab walk away from. Of course, uh, first and foremost among them is this massive mountain of debt uh, that we've got left behind. I mean, I'm not going to say that every single thing Labor did was bad. Of course not. There were some good things. The NDIS is a case uh, in point, and we were supportive of that from opposition as well. We recognised that it was going to make a material difference. Uh, we realise that we've got significant challenges to fund it as a nation. I mean, Labor now says, well, here we go, here's the NDIS, and we walk away from it and take no further responsibility for it and uh, leave it to the coalition to do the heavy lifting to fund social reforms like that, and at the same time try to get this nation's debt under control and well, start to repay that debt. We might move on to the issue of debt because the House of Representatives voted this afternoon to reject Senate amendments to the government's legislation to increase the debt ceiling from 300 to $500 billion. Labor combined with the Greens to have an increase to $400 billion. If Labor prevents an increase in the debt limit, there is no choice but to start having massive cuts to government expenditure because the government is running on borrowed money. That's what we inherited, Fran. Now, the problem was that Labor has budget debt, uh, peak debt, going to $370 billion, but they left us with a debt limit of $300 billion. This is a politically confected crisis by Joe Hockey. Uh, when there is no crisis, he's confecting one for political circumstances. The government can have an increase in the debt limit today. It'll be $400 billion, though, uh, and we think that's more than enough to get Australia through not only the immediate future, but on all the figures we have in front of us, the next few years quite easily. The House has disagreed to the Labor chamber changes and the bill will be put back to the Senate when it next sit in, sits in December. Next week, the Senators will have a chance to question the Head of Treasury and the Office of Financial Management during the Estimates Committee hearing. Now, Steve, you could have had an increase today to $400 billion. Sure. Why not take it? Because it's not enough. The reality is that the amount of debt that Labor has left behind, Lyndall, is at least $430 billion. At least $430 billion. But and it's, it's, not gonna, it's, not gonna, it's not going to hit that peak, is it, for another couple Lindell, of years? Lyndall, on Labor's own figures, on Labor's own figures, it reaches, it reaches billion $370 billion. Billion. And right. this is where David is conveniently ignoring a key fact tabled Treasury Minute by the former Treasurer, the member for Lilly, makes it clear that the Australian Office of Financial Management says you need a 40 to $60 billion deficit. Now, I'm, I'm glad. So, so I'm when glad, does it reach $370 Well, I'm glad that David dollars. acknowledges that it reaches 370 because what, 370 what well, hang on, Lyndall. Well, 370, that's, that's 370, in the 370 well, well, I'm glad you acknowledge it hmm. because 370 plus 60, which was the recommendation from the AOFM, tabled by your Treasurer, 370 plus 60 is 430. And so for that reason alone, 
That's the reason why so 400 is not completely acceptable. Well, because we know that it's 430 based on your own figures, and unfortunately, there's been a material deterioration since then, including, for example, 8.8 billion. Hang on, you asked a question. We'll just, let me we'll answer just let it. Including 8.8 billion dollars into the Reserve Bank Reserve Which Fund because Labor depleted. So right there, there's 440 billion already, and so this is the key, Lyndall. We don't want to have to keep coming back to the Parliament and saying, "Can we have more money to deal with Labor's mess?" We want to deal with it once. We want to provide certainty and stability and Labor needs to ship up and stop this rubbish and recognise that we want to do it once and provide certainty. Uh, David, the, the debt cap does need to go up. Why not do it just once? And the debt cap does need to go up and as, as I just said, I mean, Labor acknowledges the fact that debt would peak at $370 billion and, and we've made the case and we've made the case that no. um, there should be a $30 billion um, uh, buffer and that if more than that is required um, then we will obviously entertain such a request but the onus is then on the government to show us the books and make the case. The last time the Parliament and the people of Australia were shown the books the number was $370 billion so the cap has to go up, that's acknowledged but we're talking about a Liberal Party that has just come into office on the rhetoric of saying debt is evil and there's a budget emergency. Well, the budget emergency appears to have vanished and they're now proposing to increase debt by 67%. We they have not kept faith with their own rhetoric within moments of coming into this new parliament. We, we might move on to the issue of asylum seekers. Uh, Steve, the opposition tried again to ask questions of the Immigration Minister, sure. Scott Morrison. He refused to answer them. No, why, no, why is, why, well, well, he refused to give the detail the opposition sought. Why is it OK not to keep Parliament informed? Well, well, hang on. I mean, let me reject entirely the proposition of your question. I mean, we provided answers today. This, the Immigration Minister provided key answers today. Uh, and we made it very clear that we will continue, based on the advice the government has received, to provide operational updates on a weekly basis. So all the information's there, the transparency's there, and we're doing it on a weekly basis based on the advice put to the government. Now, Labor wants to focus on the fact that they want to be able to say every time a boat comes, look, here's another boat, because that's what they did when they were in government. But the indisputable facts is that our approach is working, because we've seen a 75% decrease in the number of arrivals since we've come to government, and a 90% increase since the peak back in July. Uh, David, did Labor make a mistake by, by putting out a, an alert every time a boat arrived? Well, I guess that's a debate for commentators and for historians, but what's of great interest to me right now is the fact that having come into office um, screaming day in, day out about this issue, um, the Liberal Party have now gone from trying to manage the, the tempo of the debate to in fact closing it down altogether. And what we saw in the House today was truly remarkable. We saw a Minister essentially declare that the Parliament had no right to know. We saw the Minister declare that's that only on Friday much. afternoons, that's well this is what, is, if it's not in the folder there is no answer. <laughs> Um, a, a remarkable resolve by this government to tell the Australian people and to tell the media nothing. Everybody in this building is now reading the Jakarta Post. It's the only way to find out what's going on. And when the Royalist, we hear the Royal Australian Navy is out there in, interacting with the Indonesian Navy, we hear boats coming into Darwin, the and the Post government today? will not take a question on it. Did you, we'll did did you read the Jakarta Post today? Well, as a matter of fact, I did. And what was on the front page? What, what is your point? <laughs> we, uh, Steve, I want to ask I you this question. Right the Minister says it helps people smugglers to provide that information. Sure. If that is the case, why did the Coalition ask for the information so often when it was in opposition? Look, we are dealing with a problem that was left to us by Labor, Lindell. That was fixed so by Labor. OK, all right. Well, You've you inherited know, the fruits you, of the PNG If, if any plan. members of the Australian public believe that Labor fixed our border uh, security problem, well, then they probably also believe in tooth fairies as well. But if, but if you um, believe that that information helped people smugglers, why did you ask for it so often in the Parliament when you're, you were in opposition? Well, we were asking a whole series of questions of the government, and the government provided it. Now, from our perspective, our approach is different. We make no apologies for that. It's Our different. approach it's is different. We are going to provide a weekly update. All the information is there. It will be provided weekly and provided based upon the operational advice uh, that's come to us from the three-star general that is leading this operation. But most importantly, Lyndall, the proof of the pudding is in the tasting. We've seen a 75% decrease. It's saving Australian taxpayers billions of dollars. And so Labor can squawk and squeal as much as they want. But I know the Australian public want results and we're delivering results. And that's one of the pernicious elements here, Linda. What we have here is a minister hiding behind um, Major General Angus Campbell and asking that person to do his job, and rather than answering questions from the Parliament or from the people of Australia, crouching behind the media and using uh, the military and using them as a human shield. And that's why we'll have to leave it. David Feeney and Steve Chobo, thank you very much for your Thanks, time. Lyndall.
The Abbott government's vowed never to go back to work choices, but it is making some changes in the industrial relations area, cracking down on dodgy union officials and reintroducing the construction industry watchdog. Labor doesn't like the Building and Construction Commission, but it's not yet saying how it will vote on changes to registered organisations. I spoke to the Shadow Workplace Relations Minister, Brendan O'Connor, earlier today. Brendan O'Connor, welcome to Capitol Hill. The government's introduced two pieces of legislation. We'll go to the registered organisations one first. Unions aren't small organisations these days. Its heads aren't volunteers. They're well paid. Are any, is there any reason the heads of unions shouldn't be subject to the same penalties as company directors if something goes wrong? Well, the, uh, you're right. The bill was introduced today for the first time. I've uh, just, uh, just received a copy of the bill, the explanatory memorandum, uh, and need to look at the detail, uh, but we want to see whether the motives behind the government are about a witch hunt on unions or whether in fact uh, there's any merit behind uh, the efforts uh, by the government to change the current arrangements. Uh, and uh, that's an important test. Uh, these are significant matters. They have impacts on uh, registered organisations of employees and some employers. And I think we should uh, therefore ensure that there's sufficient um, argument in favour of changing uh, these current arrangements. Do, do you believe the current arrangements are really fit for purpose or there does need to be some stronger penalties? Well I think that depends on um, a number of factors but um, there are a number of issues to which the uh, Minister representing the Employment Minister in the Chamber referred to today, I think quite in, in, inappropriately. But let's just say this, that there are, that in recent times there's been some issues about the misconduct or the alleged misconduct of uh, certain people that hold office in those registered organisations. Uh, it seems to me that um, those uh, matters are being dealt with appropriately by the courts. Uh, and I can't comment specifically on some of those matters, uh, but it's fair to say uh, that um, the outcomes of those um, decisions or th those processes by the courts uh, might well be um, answering your question. That is, um, is, it, is it the case that current laws that are in place, both in the civil and criminal jurisdiction, are sufficient to deal with improper conduct? Uh, the, the, the government, the coalition, has had these proposals out for some time, though. Do you not have a view on them already? Well, I think I had not seen the detail and I haven't examined them and I think we need to look at them and compare them with the current arrangements. Uh, but we know the government's form in its enmity towards uh, employee organisations. Uh, we know their history, their recent history has been. Uh, they've sought to assault uh, those organisations, not as an end, but as a means to ultimately diminish the capacity of ordinary working people to collectively bargain. So I guess from with that history, uh, the Labor opposition is sceptical and will examine these bills in detail before uh, responding in full. The government also introduced legislation to reconstitute the Australian Building and Construction Commission. Whatever you think of it and the extent of its powers, the last time it was in place, did it reduce disruption in the construction industry? No, it did not. And in fact, the evidence is contrary to that. Uh, the fact is, with this piece of legislation, uh, if enacted, we have, I think, already evidence, and the evidence suggests that the disputation was not lower during the period of the previous Australian Building Construction Commission, and productivity was not high. In fact, it was lower than both the preceding and, um, and, and the period post the, that, uh, that body being in... in, in uh, uh, instituted. So I think it's fair to say that we should look at the evidence. Uh, the bill itself says it's the ABCC uh, improving productivity bill. Um, on the face of it, that's a misnomer because productivity did not increase during that period and disputation did not uh, decrease. Indeed, there are some worrying concerns about the fact that the that fatalities uh, on building sites uh, increased during the period of the ABCC. So, so are you of a mind to vote against this legislation in both houses of parliament? Well, that's that's certainly our primary posi our initial position. We haven't looked at the bills in detail, but our concerns are uh, that uh, the Prime Minister, when he was Minister in the previous Howard government, uh, initiated the Royal uh, Coal the Royal Coal Commission the, the Coal Royal Commission uh, on the on what seem to be now spurious allegations of lawlessness. Uh, that Coal 
Commission or Coal Royal Commission uh, cost $66 million, uh, led to not one criminal prosecution. It was the most expensive political stunt industrial relations history in this country. But but we have seen we have seen uh, sometimes quite heated, even violent confrontations uh, involving construction unions. Mm -hmm they have not always been well behaved. No, they? it's a robust sector of our economy and industry. Uh, the Labor opposition does not and will never condone violence by anyone uh, and will not condone unlawful behaviour. Uh, but to suggest that we need to put in new laws when there are criminal laws and there are civil laws uh, that, that of course can be used when required in any sector of our economy. But Look at the way in which this bill has been constructed. Secret interviews, uh, depriving the right to have legal representation, imprisoning people if they do not cooperate uh, with interviews. I mean, those types of coercive powers are used in very exceptional circumstances, normally to do with national security. To bring this into the workplace, uh, to bring this into workplaces and to use these against ordinary workers is a very extreme and radical step. It's not bringing industrial relations back to the sensible centre. It is indeed at odds with the comments of the Prime Minister that he would act, if you like, in that manner. And we would therefore, we're very much likely to oppose these bills. Moving on now, the decision of Kevin Rudd to retire from politics, will that let the party move on from what happened over the last four years? Well, I think firstly and foremost, it, it will allow Kevin to move on and, and uh, as he said last night, uh, so emotionally and eloquently, allow uh, some relief for his family. We, all, we are all aware that in public life, particularly at that level, uh, the families uh, suffer the slings and arrows uh, of comments made. And I think, um, therefore, as he said, um, uh, his primary purpose was to perhaps to uh, finish and withdraw from public life, at least in this capacity, uh, which will take the spotlight off his family. Uh, the same, I think, could be said of um, those closest and family members of uh, Julia Gillard and indeed other uh, other leaders. Uh, it, is a, it can be a difficult life, particularly for those uh, who uh, are so close to, to leaders. Um, so, look, and it is the end of a chapter. It's an end of an, a remarkable chapter of Labor history and Australian history. Uh, as I've already said, uh, um, Kevin Rudd, uh, as Prime Minister, did some remarkable things, not least of all, uh, of course, the apology to the stolen generation, which will be there for all time, uh, and, of course, uh, steering this country through the global financial crisis. Isn't it the case that as much as they became bitter rivals, the legacies of both Kevin Rudd and Julia Gillard are entwined? The work on things considered as a legacy of Julia Gillard's prime ministership, uh, like the education reforms and the disability insurance scheme, actually started under Kevin Rudd. I think they were a remarkable team. It's unfortunate now to see what happened. Uh, if you think about it, uh, uh, Kevin had a remarkable 2007 campaign, bit a remarkable uh, campaign himself in John Howard. Uh, and uh, in that time, of course, we saw the abolition of work choices, we saw uh, the recognition of the Kyoto Treaty, we saw uh, the efforts to become uh, a member of the National Security uh, Council, we saw the uh, establishment of G20, which this government, the, the, their, the governments of Gillard and Rudd played such an important part. I had the good fortune as the Employment Minister to go to the G20 uh, uh, just recently uh, before the election, uh, and we were lauded as to our role in dealing with the global financial crisis and our role in helping establish the G20. Though that legacy, there's many things that are shared by both uh, Kevin Rudd and Julia Gillard, and whatever differences they may have had, I think, and whatever difficulties we had internally, um, I think there's some very good uh, reforms and there's a very good legacy for us to defend in opposition. Brendan O'Connor, thank you very much for your time. Thanks, Lyndall. And that is Capitol Hill for now. We will be back tomorrow. Until then, good night. Tomorrow on ABC News Breakfast, the boycott controversy over human rights ahead of the Commonwealth Leaders Summit in Sri Lanka. And join us for a special tour of the Melbourne Cricket Club as Australia's oldest sporting club celebrates 175 years.
His ability as a swimmer was all-conquering. He was a superstar. Murray Rose, Australia first. He's the golden-haired boy of Australian swimming. But it was mind games that gave Murray Rose the winning edge. I only know that I had a feeling for the water. I always think that he outsmarted many of his opponents. Australian Story. News here in far northwestern New South Wales. Reporting from Washington. London. Moscow. New Delhi. Beijing. Bangkok. Tokyo. Perth. Darwin. Alice Springs. Longreach. The Gold Coast. Sydney. Canberra. Melbourne. Reporting for ABC News 24. Hello, I'm James McHale and thanks for joining me for this national edition of ABC News. Today, the push for a $500 billion debt ceiling. But the Senate says no. Labor and the Greens sinking Joe Hockey's debt plan. Now, Madam Speaker, they think they can manage debt and deficit from opposition. But what frauds they are. A logistical logjam hindering the delivery of food and medicine in the Philippines. Three alleged barkies, the first to be charged under Queensland's new association laws. And the report into the crash that claimed the lives of three ABC employees. The first week of the 44th Parliament has ended with the stalemate over the debt ceiling still unresolved. Labor is demanding the Treasurer release his budget update to justify his bid for a $200 billion increase to the nation's debt limit. For more on this, we're joined by political reporter Andrew Green in Canberra. Uh, Andrew, what is the current status of the government's bill? Well, James, as we know, the Abbott government is looking to lift the debt ceiling from $300 billion to half a trillion, and it wants this done. Otherwise, it's warning of a US-style shutdown. But the Greens and Labor say that they want to see the full justification for this, and they'll only support a lifting of that debt limit to $400 billion. And the Senate uh, tried to amend the legislation. It was sent back to the House late today, but the House, where the government has the numbers, the lower house, rejected those amendments from Labor and the Greens. So the current status of the stalemate is that it's essentially deepened, but there was some furious debate before the House of Representatives rejected the Senate's amendments. The $500 billion is not a target, it is a limit. And the thing is, we, we don't want to get there. But I tell you what, we're not going to put the stability, the stability of the markets and the stability of the CGS program at risk as a result of Labor's incompetence in opposition. We were promised a government of no excuses. We were promised a government of no surprises. We were promised a government with the adults in charge. And we get this childish performance. Oh, order, order, we get this no. childish performance from this trainee treasurer, Mr Deputy Speaker. And Andrew, the federal opposition has again used question time to try to force the government to reveal details of its asylum policies. Was there any luck there? Look, the uh, Labor believes it uh, has the Minister Scott Morrison on the rope, on the rope over this. It uh, wants him to reveal a number of details about some incidents that have occurred recently, particularly with uh, following uh, claims from Indonesia that Australia tried to push a boat back last week. Well, the opposition is demanding that the government release uh, details of the number of boat arrivals, the number of attempted uh, turnbacks and that sort of thing. And it's really... Uh, tried to put the pressure on the Minister in Parliament. Let's take a listen. Madam Speaker, I have no information within my folder here which would which goes to the matters that would deal with the briefing I would give tomorrow, Madam Speaker. But I will tell you this once again, the communications protocols established for Operation Sovereign Borders provide for a once weekly report to be provided by the commander of the JADF at that briefing, which updates details of arrivals and transfers to offshore processing centres. And that is the practice we will follow, Madam Speaker. And obviously Labor was not satisfied with Minister Morrison's answer to that uh, question put to him in question time. And the opposition leader, Bill Shorten, took up the attack, tried to suspend the standing orders to condemn the minister. Let's take a listen. Even Sergeant Schultz on Hogan's Heroes, at least he said, I know nothing. What he should have said is, 
It is not in the folder, therefore I know nothing. It is not appropriate to say if it is not in the folder, well, I can't help you. And the minister will, of course, hold his weekly Operation Sovereign Borders uh, briefing tomorrow, as is his regular habit. He'll be, of course, accompanied by his uh, five-star general, who we're told has just arrived at Parliament House, presumably for another meeting with Scott Morrison. OK, we'll wait to see the result of that. Andrew Green, thank you. The federal government's treatment of a refugee and her sick newborn has been described as senselessly callous. The woman 